Hi there, everyone. Welcome to The Daily Gardener. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's May 22nd. Here's a gardener's bedtime ritual for this time of year. Take sandpaper or a nail file and nick those nasturtium seeds before you soak them overnight. Then sow them outside. Here's today's brevities. It's the birthday of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, born in 1859. If you search for Conan Doyle Garden on Twitter, you'll see a fantastic portrait of Doyle sitting at a table in his garden with his Irish terrier, Patty, sitting beside him on a bench. Doyle and his wife, Jean, purchased a quaint thatched cottage they called Bignall House. Running along the boundary of the garden on the property was a trout stream, and it also had a wicket gate leading directly to the forest. During the First World War, when two British girls created fake photographs of fairies, Doyle fell for the images. They inspired him to write The Coming of the Fairies, a book making the case for the existence of fairies. The garden influenced Doyle's writing. He wrote about monkshood and other poisonous plants. When his character John Watson wrote a list of Sherlock Holmes' limitations, he mentioned that Sherlock knew nothing of practical gardening. In The Adventure of the Barrel Coronet, Sherlock Holmes solves the case thanks to footprints in the garden. In Doyle's Through the Magic Door, he wrote about the value of understanding botany. A very little botany will enable you to recognize every flower you are likely to meet and to give you a tiny thrill of interest when you chance upon one which is beyond your ken. And Doyle once gave a speech heartily supporting the Early Rising Bill or Daylight Savings Bill. He said, of every hundred people in the country, 99 would benefit. The only real objection is that it would set all the sundials wrong. The need of this age is that people should get more in touch with nature. And I think that a measure which sends a man home one hour earlier to his wife and children gives him a chance to cultivate his garden, which would be of great benefit to the country. And it was on this day in 1978 that the botanist Florence Meyer Chase died. Meyer studied the relationship between sunlight and algae at the Smithsonian. Meyer and her fellow botanists used rooms in the tower and basement of the Smithsonian Castle for their research. In the early days, scientists traveled between floors of the tower by climbing up and down a ladder through a trap door, often carrying trays of specimens or scientific equipment. In 1937, on Valentine's Day, Meyer was giving people a tour around the castle. She was demonstrating how she and her group used the ladders and the trap doors to get around. As the tour wrapped up, Meyer let the group take the elevator down as there wasn't enough room for her. As the elevator door closed, Meyer waved goodbye, stepped backwards, forgot that the trap door was left open, and fell through to the floor below, breaking her back. While she was recovering at Garfield Memorial Hospital, her doctor was Dr. William Wiley Chase, the head of the surgery department. They married in 1939, and that's how she became Florence Meyer Chase. For today's Unearthed Words, we have some quotes from Victor Hugo, the author of The Hunchback of Notre Dame, as well as Les Mis. He died on this day in 1885. A gardener, Hugo had many wonderful garden-inspired sayings. He said, Life is the flower for which love is the honey. Sorrow is a fruit. God does not make it grow on limbs too weak to bear it. 
a garden to walk in, and immensity to dream in. What more could he ask? A few flowers at his feet, and above him, the stars. How did it happen that their lips came together? How does it happen that birds sing, that snow melts, that the rose unfolds, that the dawn whitens behind the stark shapes of trees on the quivering summit of the hill? A kiss and all was said. Today's book recommendation is Gardentopia by Jan Johnson. If you're looking to refresh your garden or simply looking for inspiration, Jan Johnson's new book, Gardentopia, Design Basics for Creating Beautiful Outdoor Spaces, is the perfect choice. Jan's a fabulous designer and a popular speaker. She was featured on the Still Growing podcast in episode 588. And Jan is such a delight. She's a pragmatist, highly intuitive, and she's known for her positive and collaborative approach to co-creating with nature. In her book, There's Plenty to Inspire Gardeners, the cover is spectacular, the advice is fantastic. This should be on your wish list and on your go-to gardener gift list for 2019 and beyond. Today's garden chore is to incorporate more living mulch or ground covers into your garden. Take a second to chat with any experienced gardener and they will tell you that they value ground covers more with each passing year. Dependable and hardworking, these plants solve many landscape problems. Vita Sackville West was one of the first people to use the term living mulch. She said, Why restrict your rose beds to a mere edging? Why not allow plants to encroach all over the beds? It will do the roses no harm. In fact, it will supply a living mulch to keep the ground moist and the roses cool at the root. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. In researching Doyle, I learned that the spring before he died, he was bedridden. However, one morning, he got up and managed to go out to the garden. His family found him lying on the ground with one hand clutching his heart and the other holding a single white snowdrop. He languished until July 7, 1930, when he passed away with his family at his bedside. His last words were to his wife. He whispered, You are wonderful. Newspaper accounts shared that on a beautiful summer day, he was buried in the garden where he had been so much at home beside his garden hut, which had been built for him as a writing room. Over 200 people attended his funeral. So many wreaths were sent from all over the world that they were spread over the large paddock west of the home, covering an acre of land with blooms. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced weekdays in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. You can find complete show notes over at thedailygardener.org. And be sure to share the show with your garden friends. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media, Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest, and of course, Facebook. While you're over at Facebook, don't forget to join The Daily Gardener community. Just search for these three words, Daily Gardener Community. The group will pop right up and then request to join. Finally, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, where my fabulous editor is Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.